yeah, we're addicted to money. We're, uh, we've corrupted it. We've used it to incentivize deception and violence. And I can't help but wonder what the world would look like if we move to a, a world of honest money that can't be corrupted, can't be debased, can't be stolen via coercion or violence. Um, how much would that change the general patterns of human action we observe in the world? And so that's what gets me really excited for Bitcoin. It's like a new, new substrate on which to build civilization. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Today on the show is Robert Breedlove. He is an extremely intelligent man who's been reading since he was a little kid about things like astrophysics. He has a podcast called What is Money? He considers himself a freedom maximalist and is a philosopher of Bitcoin. We might have to rethink money. We might not actually have what we think we do. It might not be as stable as we think it is. Wow. I finally feel like I have a little bit of a grasp of digital currency and why it's important. Please enjoy this episode and uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, Yeah, I I love that expression. I'm sure I'm going to get it a little bit off, but it's basically that if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I'd say that's true because anything that I stumble on, I immediately have to say, I'm working through this. Like I don't completely comprehend it myself and I'm working through it. But yeah, that's interesting to have that sort of three-step process that you have. And I'm sure it's not like you did it because you knew it would work. It just seems to be a, a pathway to really understanding something. Yeah, it just happened organically. Like I've been reading my whole life, but I didn't start writing until really getting into Bitcoin. I was reading a lot about Bitcoin when you first go into the, the Bitcoin rabbit hole, as we call it. I was just consuming a lot of content and then I was like, okay, I need to stop and get clear on what I've been learning the past year and a half to two years. So trying to write it all down and synthesize it. And then that was painful, but useful. And then just by happenstance, people would, I published the things that I wrote and people in Bitcoin circles read the things that I wrote. They liked it. They invited me on their podcast to talk about it. And so after going through that, just again, not I didn't know that was a path to like embedding your learning in a very unique way, but I learned it just sort of organically. And now I try to do it more consciously, but again, writing, I don't know. I'm, I feel like I can only do kind of one thing at a time. So when I'm in podcast mode and I'm recording with guests every day, I'm in that mode 
Mm-hmm. But then when I'm not recording with guests every day, I can get into writing mode and I'm like thinking about the writing all the time, writing, mm-hmm. reading. I have a hard time doing two things at once. So I'm still trying to figure out that trick. I can't do that either. If somebody starts talking to me and I'm on my phone, I'm just, I just immediately tell them something that simple. I'm like, I can't hear you. Yeah. I'm looking at my phone right now, doing two things <laughs> at once. But it's probably also because you go so deep. Like, I mean, you're you're not reading the Dr. Seuss of Bitcoin books or writing it. You're, you know, this stuff is like complicated. This stuff is intricate. I mean, you know, I, I'm fascinated with how, you know, I know you have a degree in, in, um, finance and accounting, but I, I, I'm fascinated with how much you know about sort of consciousness and ancient history and psychology and, philosophizing like that sort of um and how you pick the path of money or if maybe money came first that realm and then these other interests came in um i'm kind of really fascinated because you seem like you have i mean maybe my level's not as high as yours but fairly insatiable mind yeah i think so i mean i i really I, it feels like working out to me and i'm also very addicted to working out i just like to push myself and I like the feeling of, you know, with physical training, it's almost like the the counter move to the cognitive training. Like you work with your brain all day. Mm. You know, you're sitting and reading and talking and thinking. It's like you kind of overheat the <laughs> the brain. Yeah. And the risk there is you might tend to become more overthinking. And I was definitely, I've had phases in my life where I was very much an overthinker, especially my my early years prior to discovering like yoga and meditation helped me a lot with overthinking. Um, but the physical training gives you the counterbalance to that where you can just go be fully in your body. You know, you kind of like, again, once I learned about meditation and started to combine that with working out, it's like I'm matching my breath and my movement in the gym. I'm trying to meditate into the pain. Like the more it hurts, the more the discomfort comes up, you kind of go into that. And so it really like forces you to get completely out of your mind. Like a moving meditation. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And did you play uh, sports? Yeah, I did. So I did uh football and wrestling when I was young. And then I got into Olympic style weightlifting, which was my main sport from the age of thirteen to seventeen. I competed internationally and uh was really into that. Wow. Olympic weightlifting for people that don't know what that is, it's uh the lifts you typically see in CrossFit. So the explosive mm-hmm. overhead lifts. Um, Clean and then and jerks, I, deadlifts, snatches. Yeah. Yes. Squat. yes. Snatch and clean and jerk are the competitive lifts, but we did everything in training, right? Deadlifts, squats. Did you watch the CrossFit Games this weekend? No, I did not. I, w- I was there. Um, I've done CrossFit on, I mean, I did it for solely for a long time and kind of beat my body into the ground. So yeah. I just lift now. Um well, what's uh, what was your uh, what was your clean and jerk, and what was your my best your lift? Uh, <laughs> so I was in the one hundred and five kilo weight class, so two hundred and thirty pounds. I stopped when I was seventeen. And my best lifts were a one forty seven kilo snatch, which is like three twenty five, I think. Oh yeah, that's that was the top of what they were doing. Yeah, and then a one eighty two kilo clean and jerk, which is like just under right at four hundred pounds. Yep, somebody did. I think maybe three ninety six. Yeah, and if like real Olympic lifters can do a lot, like they have great videos on Instagram if you've never seen them. But um, it's a cool sport, but I don't, it's not super fun to watch unless you're into it because you got to kind of <laughs> understand the technique and the challenge of the lifts. If you're just watching it without any of that firsthand experience, it's yeah, just watching someone throw some weight over their head. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't understand how hard it is. Yeah, that's all a technique. I like to push myself, I guess. And maybe that's from my athletic background. But pushing myself physically in the gym and then with, with reading, there's just so many big ideas out there. And um, I like to read really hard, esoteric, nonfiction books. I don't know, when I was young and my mom got me into reading initially, she was basically saying, look, any problem you have or anything you're curious about, this is how you solve the problem or this is how you satiate the curiosity. It's like, you can just grab books and you can find books on anything, anywhere. And so my initial curiosity when I was a kid was about the stars and the cosmos and space and all that. 
So started reading astrophysics and all that when I was like 11, 12, 13, which is amazing. I still very fascinated by that topic. I don't read as much about it anymore, but, um, and then later on I got into, I was just very mystified with like people talk about stock markets and equities and bonds and and I'm like, what is all that? Like, it didn't make any sense to me. Like, what are all these weird abstract concepts that people are like really making a big deal about? They're, you know, people get really swept up in what they own and buying and selling and trading, but I couldn't really understand what that meant. Like, in particular, a stock certificate. I was like, what is a stock? What does that mean? You just like own little pieces of something on a piece of paper. Like, how does that? So I started going into the like the economics and money rabbit hole and. I guess to answer your question, like which came first, um, really money, like actually getting, when I read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin, it's a great book. It's about the inception of the Federal Reserve in the US. It's about the nature of central banking in general. Uh, he actually has a, a chapter or at least a segment in that book titled, What is Money? So he goes into the nature of money itself, uh, which I didn't know that until I reread the book about six months ago. So I'm not sure if the inspiration for the show came from exactly. that. If <laughs> the seed uh, was planted. Yeah. It's a totally great topic because it's it's like it's honestly not just paper, right? Because the paper is like like this is nothing, right? It's the symbolism, it's the purpose of it, it's how it came about, it's the reason why, it's the the way it becomes corrupted. And, you know, it's everything is a reflection on other things. So yeah. it's it's a much deeper topic than just money, money, the way we Yeah, do. it's okay. a, and it's a hard question to answer. Like after three years of doing the show, we've accumulated a lot of answers to the question. And, a lot, you know, a lot of them make sense in their own right, mm. but none of them are comprehensive. Well, when you ask these other fundamental questions, right, what is freedom? What is truth? What is love? You know, you... You're like, oh, it's so obvious. But then you try to really answer it and articulate it, and you end up with a diatribe, right? There's a bunch of answers, a bunch of different perspectives on it. Truth is a great one, right? It's like, that should be the most obvious thing in the world. It's just, But philosophers have been writing about the nature of truth for hundreds and hundreds of years, and no one's really settled on what it is. Like You can't capture it in words, per se. To understand money, the best analogy is probably to something like language. It's a symbolic technology or, or a symbolic structure. Uh, John Verveke calls it a psychotechnology. So whereas a, a normal technology improves your physical fitness to the world, right? A shovel lets you dig more holes with less effort, something like that. A psychotechnology improves your cerebral fitness to the world. So in the case of language, right, we can map reality, we can map our experiences and encode it into written or audio form such that we can communicate with one another about it. Mm -hmm. It's like we're it's like data compression. So we have experience that feeds our mm -hmm. perceptions and then the mm -hmm. perceptions can be fed into conceptions. The conceptions are encoded in language and we can use that to both think internally, right? So we can analyze, reflect on our experience. We can look into the future. Money is like the medium of exchange for human action. Mm. It's telling you what, what mm -hmm. actually has been done, right? What favors mm -hmm. an entrepreneur mm -hmm. has rendered to the market, mm -hmm. how many favors the market sort of owes him back in, in the mm -hmm. form of his saved purchasing power. And, uh, and it helps coordinate human action, right? It's what coordinates the entire market process. We all kind of get out of bed in the morning, typically to go do something for money. Like unless you're mm -hmm. on vacation and you're mm -hmm. spending money, you're probably going to work and making money. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, money yeah, that's there. true. You're either spending it or making it usually. Yeah. So it's very, we're very much immersed in this economic ether. We're thinking through it actually, just like we think through language. So when you're calculating, negotiating or executing a trade, or, you know, looking, am I going to buy this house? Am I going to buy this car? Am I going to go on this trip? Like you're actually thinking in prices relative to how much money you have. So it's a, it's a cognitive tool, right? What Pravik would call a psychotechnology, but it's a little bit strange because where language is purely a cognitive tool, there's no physical manifestation of English, right? That where, where is the English language? It's nowhere. It's just kind of the software. Mm -hmm. Money does have a rooting to physical reality. 
And historically, that rooting was was gold um, mm-hmm. or, or commodity monies. And it needed to have that rooting because money has to be scarce. It has to be physically constrained from overproduction because if you over overproduce the money, you hyperinflate it, right? You dilute it. You mean when you pour money? Yes. So again, money is a strange one. It's like part psychotechnology, part physical technology because it needed to be rooted in physics such that we don't overprint it or overproduce it. Money being something that used to get represented by commodities, by gold, by other 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 natural resources. Um, now it's backed by countries, right? It's a, the fiat fiat currencies are backed by the country essentially. Is that right? So this is a good question. Um, what well, you're basically, you know, so on the U.S. dollar bill, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So the question is, what is the U.S. government? Well, Rothbard said, the state is the social apparatus of coercion, compulsion, and violence. So the state is the organization that derives all its revenues by legally stealing from other people. So when you ask what backs the U.S. dollar, it's this coercive apparatus we call the state. And it's our belief that it will remain a going concern into the future, which means it's our belief that we will continue to systematically plunder people through this apparatus and it will will be a business into the future that can issue currency and and prevent others from doing it. So a business that can't lose, is that also- That's right. Really yeah, that's problem. right. And you could and you could get more specific and say it's the central bank in particular mm-hmm. because you could have a nation state that does not have a central bank and then they technically can't plunder you through currency counterfeiting. They can still plunder you through taxation. Um, but yeah, when you have a central bank installed, you have a business that can't lose, right? If a business can print money, how can you ever lose money? If you generate a loss, well, guess what? You just print more money and paper over the loss and you're in the black again. So I'm trying this- to ask my CPA about this, about like the debt and how this all works. And he's like, look, it, we have enough stuff here to back up this debt. Like we have X amount, but he's like, look, there's a breaking point, obviously. Yeah, the breaking point, I mean- I mean, so I made another- him sound really silly. It's actually me that sounds silly. He did a much better job of articulating it, but- Well, it's a consequence of- fiat currency, this excess debt accumulation, because when money is being debased or depreciated over time, everyone is incentivized to borrow the stronger dollars today and buy assets and pay back the weaker dollars over time. So it's an incentive distortion. And that incentive distortion is because the money is being overproduced. If you're on a gold standard, you're not incentivizing debt accumulation because gold gets stronger over time. So if I'm going to I would have very little incentive to borrow weaker gold today and pay back stronger gold over time. Like maybe occasionally you have this incentive. If you're in a commercial business that, you know, yields that has an economic yield that outpaces the actual appreciation of gold. But for consumers, we wouldn't want to do this. So the excess of debt in the world is a consequence of what I call the corruption of money, which is the central centralization and monopolization of money under the central bank. Bitcoin is, which is your area of X, one of your areas of expertise. I would not say it's an area of expertise. I don't think anyone's a really? Bitcoin expert. We're all figuring it out. Well, that's one question is why is it so complicated is number one. Back to what we started talking about at the beginning is that if you can't understand something well enough, you can't really explain it simply, which is, seems to be the case with Bitcoin. I have a couple of friends who are really smart and have learned a lot through about it and they're like well it's very complicated and i'm like that doesn't help me that does not help me because i have all my money in you know in dollars and i don't understand but one of the things i've I've been asking about digital currency for years and asking my financial advisor if we need to you know allocate some of my you know wealth in that area and he's like look we've put in at this point in time, he was like, they were working on it. And he's like, we put in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours and we just can't figure out how someone else isn't just going to go make another currency. Why won't it get diluted? Because there will be so many different digital currencies. And so, 
you know what I'm saying is it's not necessarily backed by anything other than scarcity. And so the dollar is essentially backed by something, it seems like at this point that we have. It's not gold anymore, but it's not it's not necessarily commodities, but we have enough apparently as a country, I'm sure others do, to back up the debt. So there is something there, but these digital currencies are, are are kind of an artificial. It's a it's an it's an agreement. We we have a social agreement that this is worth something, and yeah. over time can be built through the. I always tell everyone, I'm like, look, money's just energy, man. If you want to go, you want more of it, go do something. Sure. And you know, there's a scale for all that, but it's essentially the mechanism. So. Yeah. You know, how is it that so we can build, you can build anyone, any currency to being a, an agreed upon con construct to reflect the energy that you you use to go do something um, or build something or whatever it may be. So what makes Bitcoin? Why do you believe in it? Yeah, so I love I think this is um, I forget which late night talk show host this was, but he said. Take everything you don't know about money, combine everything you don't know about the internet, and you got Bitcoin, basically. Cool. So it is it is complicated because, well, do you know how the internet works? Like, kind of complicated. Do yeah. you know how money works? Well, I've spent three years running a show called What is Money? And I think it's still complicated, right? I don't have a good, I have many answers for you, but I don't have one simple catch-all answer. It takes time. An effort to look into it so it's it's inherently complicated um to speak to the advice you received from your financial advisor um i would first consider you, this is something you learn getting into bitcoin is there's a saying that no man is better than his incentives so we have to always consider that everyone including ourselves we're always talking our own book to some extent right um and it this doesn't this doesn't mean you can't trust anyone's advice, but you just have to take it with a grain of salt and understand where they're coming from. Your financial advisor, for instance, probably works for one of the big bracket banks, um, and he gets his commands from on high that, mm -hmm. hey, Charlie Munger or uh, whoever is it, that, you know, Jamie Dimon, whatever guy is at the top of his bank doesn't like Bitcoin. We're not going to sell Bitcoin. We're not going to talk about Bitcoin. We're going to tell our clients this. Sure. Totally and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and so the criticism that he rendered at Bitcoin that it's oh we don't understand how it can be scarce because anyone can copy and paste this thing and create a new currency. That's true, actually. So there's a grain of truth in that, and it's very difficult to understand why that's not an actual threat on Bitcoin. Because um, to your point, money like language is this social construct. We, you and I could go start Danica coin right now on the Ethereum blockchain in 15 minutes and we yeah. could go start selling it online and say this is the next big currency of the world. Rah, rah. Something else could be valuable other than gold. Find something else that there's not a lot of and call it that, you know? Sure. But the thing is, you always end up in the situation where you're campaigning for something to become money versus something emerging naturally as money, right? No one ever campaigned for gold to become money. It was selected over time through this organic market process where people are just choosing the best tool for the job. Yeah. And gradually they, they dispense with less adequate tools. You know, for a long time we use silver, we use bronze, we've used cattle, salt, all kinds of things as money. But over time, through market interaction, people learn that, well, salt's not as good as silver, silver's not as good as gold. And eventually in the 1800s, we're on basically a universal gold standard worldwide. Mm -hmm. Once the whole world is wired together by telecommunication networks, the world settles on one monetary standard. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> to say that you can just go copy paste Bitcoin and create a new one, therefore it's dilutive to Bitcoin. I think the analogy that's useful here is anyone can change the rules of chess, right? We can take the, the existing game of chess, we can change the rules, we can make pawns be able to move diagonally and kill going forward, right? Whereas today they move forward and kill diagonally. Or maybe we make the queen a lot weaker, or we make the king a lot stronger, whatever we want to do. But when we go and campaign other people to play chess with us in the world, based on our new rule set, who's going to play with us? Right? Like you, it's 
Chess is open source software. English is open source software. I can make up new words right here on the fly and to say, oh, glibbity glack. It's a new word and it means a chair sitting on top of a table, right? Does that mean anyone's going to use that word? Have I changed social consensus at all? I mean, I can go out and like campaign and try to get people to use the new word. Maybe I'll succeed. Maybe I won't. But there's no, it's not like you just copy and paste and create a new word and then stick it in the English language and people start using it. Or you copy and paste the rules of chess and you tweak a few of them and then people start playing by them. Okay. There's this, it has to be a, an emergent phenomenon. So with Bitcoin, we've seen, I think we've had probably close to 50,000 alternative crypto assets, mm. which are copy paste of Bitcoin over the past 14 years. And they've essentially all, like with the, I think the exception of two, the last we looked at this over a four year period, they had collapsed in terms of Bitcoin. So and if you price them in terms of Bitcoin, they had collapsed, you know, 90 plus percent. Society is choosing this path, just like it shows gold or just like it, it's choosing it because all the others are failing. And also it is here to try and it is here for a reason. So what would that reason be? Yeah. And so I've got a number of things here. It could be strongly argued that Bitcoin is the only credibly decentralized project so it's much more like the internet itself. Like these internet protocols we are familiar with, HTTP, TCP, IP, these aren't companies. No one controls them. They're just emergent protocols that were selected for their usability. Now the internet really is that. It's just a stack of open source protocols that lets us move information around the world without asking permission from anyone. And Bitcoin is just kind of the latest layer in that internet protocol stack. But instead of letting us move information, we can move economic value without permission. And so you could look at it that way and say Bitcoin's the only truly decentralized um, protocol. Everything else is controlled by someone. Every other crypto asset is controlled by someone or some people, some foundation. So therefore, it's not decentralized. Um, another way to look at this is one really important answer to the question, what is money, is what are the properties people seek in good money? And I've articulated this on a lot of other shows, but so I won't, I won't elaborate on them here, but I'll just mention them. Uh -huh. People seek a money that's divisible, durable, recognizable, portable, and scarce. Like these are the, the, the services people want from a good monetary technology. Mm -hmm. And historically, monetary metals were the most divisible, durable, recognizable, and portable monetary technology available to the world. And of all the monetary metals that were available, gold was the most scarce. So that's why we selected gold as money, as the best tool for the job over time. If you use that same framework to evaluate Bitcoin, we have a technology that's basically perfected all the properties of money. So in a way, Satoshi left no design space for another competitive asset to come in and introduce any superior feature. You can't, like Bitcoin is perfectly divisible, you know, you down it's divisible to 100 million subunits now you can increase the divisibility with a soft fork which is a backwards uh compatible software update um again i don't want to elaborate too much it's infinitely durable basically it's distributed information so no one knows how to get rid of it infinitely portable because it's just information you can move it at the speed of light how was this created then how 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 was what is his name again that started? satoshi nakamoto and we don't really know who he is no one knows who he is and we just uh, found out that he's a guy, right? Kind of. He you know, identified guy, himself right? as a guy. So we'll take him at his word. Could he be just like an emerging AI? There's a lot of theories out there. He's an alien. He's a time traveler. Yeah. Who knows? Um, but he just released this open source software project into a chat room of cypherpunks, which are a, a group of people that have been trying to crack non-state digital cash for like 25 years. So he released the project into the right group that would start to adopt it and use it. And it just grew organically from there. Bitcoin's also perfectly recognizable because you can audit the whole supply. And then finally, it's perfectly scarce in that it's a fixed supply asset. We don't, there's no such thing as a fixed supply asset in the physical world. You can't guarantee a fixed supply, but in the digital world with Bitcoin, you can. And that's, uh, you know, probably heard of the 21 million hard cap for Bitcoin, which is one of its most important features because you know you can't be diluted or debased over time through the printing of money. So it's money we can't print. 
for someone like myself or probably a lot of people, like what happens with my money? I mean, is this somewhat of the thing that's happening in the world? People are trying to figure out how they're going to protect their their wealth that's in the conventional form that we've known it so that they don't lose it. I mean, because what you're saying then is that Bitcoin will the the price per coin will change, right? Mm-hmm. So it can adjust, but so it could expand as far as possible. There's only a certain amount of coins, but oh, well, the price, yeah, the, the price, price for- and the quantity are different, yeah. So the money, the supply of circulating bitcoins, can never exceed 21 million. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when you talk about a price, we have to remember what we're talking about. We commonly think of price in the terms of dollars, but you can price mm-hmm. anything in terms of anything else. It's just it's a ratio. It's a numerator and denominator, right? I can price Bitcoin in lira. I can price Bitcoin in yen. I can price Bitcoin in pounds. I can price Bitcoin in cars. I can price Bitcoin in tables. It's just how many things does this thing buy me? When you see uh, the price going up, this is something, I call this a cognitive optical illusion. The US dollar price of Bitcoin is going up. People think, oh, Bitcoin's becoming more valuable. And there might be some truth to that, but what you're not seeing is that the purchasing power of the dollar is also going down when we print, when we counterfeit new dollars, as the Federal Reserve does by the trillion. You know, we call this inflation. The prices of things go up. But another way to look at that and say the same thing is like, well, the purchasing power of the dollar is going down. Mm -hmm. So when the price of steak goes from $20 a kilo to $50 a kilo, that doesn't mean steak is more valuable or more widely demanded per se. Probably hasn't changed that much, actually. Like the demand for, you know, fixed things like steak, people are probably still eating about the same amount. Who knows? Paul Saladino, maybe he's making beef more popular. I don't know. And liver. And and liver, yeah. And and papaya. uh, (laughs) And papaya. But it hides. It's this optical illusion that people don't, Again, you have to like invert and say, oh, well, and this is also tricky for people that think, oh, I bought a house and the property value is going up. You always hear that. The value is going up. My equities are going up. Stocks are performing mm-hmm. really well. But it it disguises the diminishment of the purchasing power of the US dollar itself, which is also occurring as we print money. And we have printed a lot of money over the past three years. Um, I think roughly 50% of the US dollars in circulation were produced over the past three years. No way. And the Federal Reserve has been producing dollars since 1913. So 110 years of US dollar production, half of them were produced in the past three years. So if you met, if you imagine that chart, right, like a long, steady increase in US dollars in the past three years is just a vertical line. Seems like a, you know, a bullet train that just doubled its speed. That's right. Wall. Yes, that's right. And um, and of course, you know, you hear a lot about inflation, but mainstream media is always calling it Putin's inflation or uh, supply chain disruptions causing inflation. Uh, I even saw something ridiculous in Europe that they were saying the Beyonce concert caused inflation. They'll say they'll assign. Oh, well, yeah. Taylor blame. Swift and- yeah. They'll oh, yeah. blame anything other than the mass counterfeiting of currency that the central bank perpetrates. Wow. Which is the blatant, the greatest obvious in answer. History is political authority. Central banking in particular, you know, um, you could. I mean, there's there's arguments to be made about political authority that obviously we need we need to wield force. We have to deal with the realities of physical force, right? If someone coerces or hurts someone, well, we need some type of apparatus to deal with that criminal, right? You need prisons, you need security, et cetera. So I wouldn't say political force is necessarily the scam, but central banking is definitely a scam. It's just a pyramid scheme. Those that can print money are able to steal from those who cannot print money. And those who can print money enforce their privilege with guns, guns and laws basically and so it's a it's a form of legal plunder to use a term from bastiat now i'd like to tell you about our sponsor icoin technology icoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet looks like a mini iphone a little touch screen and camera on it Uh, the device has no wi-fi no cellular connection no gps it's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet Uh, like i said it's got a high res three inch touch screen It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. 
Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility, and it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Has this happened in history before? Is Since there a banking. track record of what, what's happened in the past If the, when on this path? Yeah, there's a great book by Nick Batia, my friend in LA. It's called Layered Money. Uh, very easy read, probably two to four hours. And he goes through the history of central banking. Um, I think it started originally in the 1600s in Antwerp. And then the Bank of England was uh, a major, major central bank for a long time. A lot of the reason... A lot of the reasoning behind the American Revolution was to escape the grip of the Bank of England... And uh, then we have the Federal Reserve here in the United States, which again, that book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, I think is a must read for everybody. Uh, it's a nonfiction book, but it reads like a literary investigation novel. And it's really, really good. And so, yeah, central banks increase wealth inequality. You're stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. A lot of the stolen purchasing power is used to fund warfare. They typically fund both sides of the conflict um, because you can't lose that way, right? You're just loaning, making loans to both sides, both combatants in a conflict, which obviously drives the scale, scope, and severity of warfare. There's a good argument to be made that neither wo- World War One nor World War Two would have been possible at the to the scope that they were possible without central banking. Typically, a warring state is confined to the, their own balance sheet, right? They can only afford to spend on combat what they have in their treasury. Mm-hmm. So they have a, a war chest, as, as you might say, that is limited. Yeah. But when you can counterfeit currency, all of a sudden you can steal the savings of everyone using the currency. So you expand your war chest to the entire savings of society. So you can go to war for much longer and wars become mm-hmm. much more brutal and violent and, you know, enduring, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all a consequence of central banking. Um, I think there's a strong argument to be made as well that a lot of the mainstream media bullshit, propaganda, psyops, corruption of language, all of these uh, deceptions we see propagating in modernity, a lot of this is driven by central banking because you're incentivized really? to keep the population confused and divided amongst themselves such that you can keep pointing out different boogeymen for all the problems. All the while, you just keep printing currency, taxing them via inflation, and you keep the scheme going. So it's a classic exactly. divi- divide and conquer mm-hmm. technique. And so it's kind of a, a weird metaphysical claim, but when you make the money bullshit, right? You make the money a lie. It's no longer what the market selected it to be. The whole world gets awash in bullshit. Um, I had a guest recently that answered the question, what is money? He said it's a symbolic, how did he put this? It's a symbolic structure for the exchange of life energy. And so when you dilute money, you're diluting the exchange of life energy. And in a very real sense, when we dilute money, we get a loss of truth, right? Society drifts from truth. You get all this mainstream media nonsense that we're all awash in today, wokeism, all this cultural degeneration. You get warfare. So you get real loss of life, real loss of capital and wealth destroyed in war. It's the most expensive and self-destructive enterprise humans can engage in as warfare. Hmm. Nobody wins. Mm. I mean, you could say the central bankers win because they loan to both sides, they collect right, interest right. and roll on, but no one, like collectively, no one wins. We we regress as a species. It kind of takes you back to that big question, like what is money? I don't know. It's like it's like the lifeblood of the human species. And so when we corrupt the money, we corrupt our blood and we suffer from all these socioeconomic pathologies. And if that's correct, then... Bitcoin as incorruptible money is something that's very important, very important for creating a sustainable civilization and a less violent, less violent and uh, less violent human enterprise and one that's characterized by more human flourishing. 
I mean, I'd like to think it's all the things that you said would maybe be the polarity to it, but money also, it's like, I've thought many times, like, why don't we just take money away and trade our talents? You know, why don't we, you know, if I can build a house, then you can do the plumbing and someone else can do gardening and plant the vegetables and, you know, or the fruits if you're a Paul Saladino guy. And um, like, you you know, you can you can trade your, your services. Um, so, but, you know, if there's a lagging people in, in the culture, then, you know, it could get skewed. Right. So it's mm-hmm. kind of like an honesty. It's like almost like a, it keeps people honest. If you want to be able to do something, buy something, you need to have done something for the money to do it to yeah. sort of like make the trade more fair. Yeah. Um, it but keeps it keeps you honest when the money's honest. Right. But the money's but not the, honest. The money's not honest because, as you said earlier, right, we're all working for dollars. Everyone that's not a shareholder of a central bank has to work to accumulate dollars. That's right. If you're the shareholder of a central bank, you just hit control P and you have more dollars. So and who is it then? Like, I mean, and, and is So the, the big banks yeah. own the central bank in the US. And then uh, and it's very, actually very difficult to uncover who the actual individuals are that ultimately have ultimate beneficial ownership of the central bank. But the big banks own the central bank. And then you could look at the shareholders of the big banks. But a lot of a lot of families jump out immediately that you've probably heard of the Rothschilds. Yeah, Rock yeah, you know, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So these are families that have owned a lot of wealth, a majority of the wealth of the human species for many centuries, and um, it's you know purposefully shrouded in darkness because it's not a pretty picture. Do you believe the? Uh, do you believe in the Titanic ex- Titanic conspiracy about? The guys that were on the boat were opposing the Federal Reserve and the ones that wanted it were not on the boat and one got off just before or something like that. And That's right. Yeah. So it's a very interesting theory. I don't know. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, I did hear- Your esoteric thoughts. I thought maybe conspiracies fell under that. Oh, definitely. I'm very much a conspiracy theorist. (laughs) People are going to label me, but- we need to retitle conspiracy theorist, by the way. It just means Truth ideas seeker. that might be true. <laughs> well, I mean, so the original term conspiracy theorist, I think, was created by the CIA post JFK's assassination, right? To try and diminish uh, that truth seeking. Which RFK just said, RFK just said that they killed him. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah. We we're on a spaces with him the other day and oh, he had right. a lot to say about that. Um, oh, boy. Again, probably related to central banking because JFK had passed an executive order about three months before his assassination, executive order 11110, that was going to start to take away power from the Federal Reserve. Now, who knows? Again, these are speculations. Um, But the Titanic, further to that theory, Mm -hmm. I heard that there was a reason we have restricted private submarine visitations to the Titanic because apparently... Uh, there were report. There was reported to be explosions prior to the boat hitting the iceberg, and so if you could get visual, if you could get a visual on the boat and you could see the blast of the hull going outward, that would confirm that it was an internal explosion, not and not an iceberg striking it from the outside. And um, there was there was another piece to this where they talked about the recent submarine implosion. Mm-hmm. And how they were going to use that as a scapegoat to p- completely prevent any visitation to the Titanic to try and bury the conspiracy once and for all. That would make so, sense. So I don't know. Look, I'm not saying this is true, but interesting things to think about. And when you, I mean, it's dark though. When you get into the history of money, you really, and I think you see this, if you kind of stop and take a breath and really reflect on yourself and your life experience so far, like, don't you see a lot of people fighting over money, chasing money, like, it's kind of we're 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 animals, you know. We're all looking out for our own self interest, and so if you take that game to its maximum echelon, to control the money is to effectively control the world, right? There's a Rothschild quote: "Give me the power to issue a nation's currency. I care not who makes its laws." Or said differently, "He who has the gold makes the rules." So, people that are in pursuit of absolute power, there is nothing closer to absolute power than the control over money 
And so I think people have done a lot of really dark, twisted things to try and gain that power. Um, and it, it, it informs your views about warfare. You know, that we always get these in school, we're always taught these kind of moral crusades, why the United States went to war. You know, the Civil War was about slavery. Or World War II was about, you know, bringing democracy here, or saving people from Germany or whatever. But it's never actually about that. I mean, governments are businesses. They're trying to tax people. Uh, they go to war occasionally with each other. And the war, the purpose of the war is so that they can expand their dominion. Right? They want to expand their tax base. Germany's like, I want to capture and tax more people, have more power. And so when you start to see world history through the lens of money, I think things make a lot more sense. Like, oh, these are just businesses that are competing with each other, but the business they're in is human coercion, compulsion, and violence. So when they compete, what does that look like? It looks like warfare. And um, you think it's more corrupt than ever right now? Well, I mean, my belief is that... Or more apparent. We're animals responding to incentives. So when there are incentives to be physically violent, as there are under a gold standard where you can steal gold from someone or you can conquer them and steal their gold, there's an incentive to be violent there. I think the incentives for violence are exacerbated when you move on to a fiat standard because, again, you're not confined to your own war chest. You can now steal the saving. You can hyperinflate the currency and steal the savings of society to wage war, which is indeed exactly what happened prior to Hitler. In World War I, we had Germany hyperinflated its currency, funding the war effort and paying for reparations. And from the ashes of that hyperinflation, Hitler rose to power. So like this, I think it's incentives that drive human action. And this is where Bitcoin is really important because you have a, a dematerialized form of gold that's really impossible to steal, really difficult to steal, let's say, via physical force. Because it's just informational, you can custody be in any information bearing medium, and so all is it the codes. Is it's code, right? It's a code. Yeah, it's code. So you can think about possessing Bitcoin as just owning. You like waterboard someone for a code. Yeah, but here's the thing: right. you but can like, take that code and chop it into multiple pieces and give it to an undisclosed circle of trust, right? Maybe you get. It's called a multi sig forum. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. This is what we yeah. like. Yeah. My Bitcoin is in a multi sig. So there are people that have pieces of the key. You can come waterboard me all you want. I can't. You don't it. know it, <laughs> and you don't. Know I don't know it exactly. Don't I don't have it in its totality, it. and you don't know who has the rest of the pieces, and you don't know the protocol necessary for us to come together and the code words. If I tell them, yeah. if I call them, and I say a certain word or don't say a certain word, then it tells them what sh what they should or should not do. So it makes totally. it very impossible, like very difficult at least, to steal someone's Bitcoin in that world. And so all of a sudden, the incentives of violence are reduced. Yeah. It's like, if I'm going to spend all this money to go to war with you or attack you, but I, the carrot at the end of that stick is smaller, then I'm less likely to engage in coercion or violence. So I think that fundamentally reshapes how humans organize themselves. So I kind of believe in things from a, I like look like looking at the micro and assuming the macro in this fractal. As above, so below. This fractal real reality we're living in and it. When you talked about central government and who's in charge and the corruption, like who is that we don't really know, essentially, it's like almost like the it's like the it's like the devil inside that we don't mm -hmm. quite know that we're trying to figure out. Bingo. And that it's an expression of this human experience of greed, of corruption, of a betrayal. Um uh, manipulation, um, stealing. It's just, it's a reflection of us in some way. Yes. You buy yes. into that? Yeah. Well, you are hitting the nail on the head. Um, I had this realization at a Joe Dispenza advanced meditation retreat, nice. actually. Did you like it? I did one too. I loved it. And yeah. exactly love, what love you're meditation. saying. There's plenty of hours for you. Yeah. yeah. Almost exactly what you're saying is one of the revelations I had. And really? um, there's the classic quote, Solzhenitsyn, right? The line between good and evil cuts down the heart of every man. I hope that's Solzhenitsyn. Sometimes confuse him and Dostoevsky. But it lives within all of us, Me right? Too. The potential yeah. for good and evil. <laughs> and um, what you're describing there, the as above, so below um, principle, I think that 
we eat, all of us have an ego, right? And the ego is kind of this illusion that we're separate from the world. And in many ways we are, right? For many practical purposes, what do they say in the rap song? What I eat don't make you shit, right? Like I'm separate from you. I have a different skin boundary, different mind, different perceptions, conceptions, et cetera. But there's in a deeper sense, we're all interconnected, right? We're all breathing the same air in a energetic vibrational sense. We're all kind of inhabiting the same reality. Yeah. yeah. And so we have this illusion of separateness within each of us called the ego, and it's useful mm -hmm. in many ways that mm -hmm. the saber-toothed tiger jumps through the window, like mm -hmm. the ego is what gets you to get up and run. Mm -hmm. If you were just- Because you were dangerous. Yeah, if you were just blissed so out in meditation and we're all are one, like that wouldn't be very useful for propagating the species, right? You'd just right. get eaten. So there's kind of this necessary illusion inside of us. So that's the microcosm. And I think when you look out- into the macrocosm that the state is the macrocosm of the ego in a way. There's this illusion of separateness, right? That the United States is somehow separate from China, somehow separate mm -hmm. from Canada, somehow se mm -hmm. when the reality is we all inhabit one ecology, we're in one global marketplace. Um, you know, it's individuals, it's a complex of individuals moving around. These imaginary lines we've drawn on the land and said, no, this is this state, this is that state. They're useful fictions, but they are fictions, right? They're not reality at all. Yeah. And so I a think, literal line in the sand to say this is the separation between, you know. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And we and we start to think in terms of that too, right? We even say things like, oh, what is America going to do? It's like, there is no America. There's a <laughs> bunch of individuals that believe in this structure called America. There's a few individuals that influence the the decisions disproportionately, right? Like politicians, you know, et cetera. And so something about overcoming that illusion of separateness that we have at both the egoic microcosm and the statist macrocosm seems to be key to having sustainable, peaceful, loving relationships. And I, you know, I don't know what that, do we ever get there? I don't know. We've, I think we've had evolutions of consciousness over time. Like even today, the idea of private property rights, for instance, that an individual can own something or own you know, have a bank account that is their own. 2000 mm -hmm. years ago was a nonsensical idea. There was mm -hmm. no idea of the individual. There was the patriarchy, mm -hmm. the paterfamilias, the father owns the family. The father can mm -hmm. kill his daughter in broad daylight in the middle of the street, perfectly legal. He owns his family. All this pre-Christ pagan stuff, that was normal. Well, we've evolved over time and now mm -hmm. we have much more sophisticated moral intuitions and um, hopefully more useful institutions like private property that help us collaborate and generate more wealth and uh, improve our standards of living. So I do believe in our ability to adapt, but we've got a long way to go. Um, we're, we're a species that's sort of obsessed with violence in a lot of ways. Like if you watch movies, right? What, what are we doing in movies all the time? It's just fucking shootings and killings and this and that and fighting. Um, Everybody loving their John Wick movies. Yeah, exactly. And I can't help but wonder to what extent is that a consequence of the incentive systems that we are inhabiting? And so... Quick fixes, porn. Yeah, you know, addiction, right? The addiction. Fiat, you could argue that fiat currency is an addiction too because you you always need more. Like every, mm. You get diminishing returns on each round of money printing. So that's why... We always print exponentially more money every time there's a crisis. 2008, we printed $700 billion. In 2020, we printed $6 trillion, right? So 10x more. And when you study hyperinflation historically, that's what tends to happen. They print like 10 times more money each time until eventually the currency just collapses. So yeah, we're addicted to money. We're, uh, we've corrupted it. We've used it to incentivize deception and violence and i can't help but wonder what the world would look like if we move to a, a world of honest money that can't be corrupted can't be debased can't be stolen via coercion or violence um how much would that change the general patterns of human action we observe in the world and so that's what gets me really excited for bitcoin it's like a new new substrate on which to build civilization now i'd like to tell you about our sponsor wasabi wallet with Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. 
In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. What do you think of the one world government sort of movement that seems to be happening? There's obviously, I feel like a lot of people with high integrity and spiritual or open-minded, there's just like a concern for this sort of tyranny, this you know one very, very, very top-down system. But on the other hand, there's this talk about like, we're not any different. And, you know, there really isn't a line in the sand that divides this country and that one. And these are sort of agreements that we have that sort of make things a little easier, perhaps. Um, you can live somewhere where the rules feel comfortable or whatever it may be. Right. So what are your thoughts about all of this and and how this applies or, you know, if you feel if you feel like that's a good idea or a bad idea? Well, uh, the government that governs best governs least. So uh -huh. any buildup of government power is worse for the human race. No doubt about that. Um, hmm. I would argue that it's, again, a symptom of the centralization of money. There's a reason you're hearing so much about central bank digital currencies. These central governments, especially like one world central government, is not you. you could not ever implement that without centrally planning and controlling the money. That's an indispensable ingredient to the whole idea of one world central government. So again, I think it's really bad. And I think if you, as humanity moves onto a Bitcoin standard, and we didn't talk about that a lot today, but there's a kind of a rough um, prediction. It's like, as currencies are debased more rapidly, people naturally seek to store their wealth into something that can't be debased. Sure. This is why gold has done so well over time, mm -hmm. uh, but gold suffers from all of its physical limitations. So the theory is people can't stop printing money. The more you print money, the more valuable Bitcoin becomes. And then the more oppressive and uh, coercive governments become as they're losing control you're actually pushing people more into Bitcoin because people want to control an asset that no one can take away from them, right? Right. So as governments are attempting to become more violent, more coercive, more extractive, well, you're going to naturally have demand for the asset that is maximally immune to all that. And so there's this theory that over time, you know, we move into like a Bitcoinized world. And I think in a Bitcoinized world, the whole notion of one world government will just fall away. Really? Because it won't be possible. It won't. It absolutely won't be possible because you can't centrally plan and control Bitcoin. So how could you possibly have a centrally planned and controlled government without yeah. centrally planned and controlled money? What about a whole big control delete scenario where like, what if technology just goes, like what, yeah. you, you know, shut the computers down, shut the systems down. If there's one person in charge and they have no control over everyone, all they need to do is send anyone, everyone into, you know, crisis anarchy mode and yeah I mean, you can't hold bitcoin well so the the question you're asking is and this is a good question for looking at bitcoin existentially the question is well how do you stop bitcoin is the question and then the analogous question would be how do you turn off the internet everywhere forever it's not good enough to just shut it down here or there, even for a short period of time. You need to turn off the internet everywhere forever. And we should probably define the internet, right? The, the internet is any network of connected computers. So it's not like there's a thing somewhere that we can drop a bomb on called the internet and the internet goes off. The internet is literally the, what's the old saying that the, the network is the computer. So the computing, the connections mm -hmm. of computers and individuals running those computers is the internet. We are actually part of the internet, right? We're using it right yeah. now. We're we're operating components of the internet. So like like at the a, end of the movie Lucy. 
I haven't seen that one. Oh man, it's about her being able to use 100% of her brain by this certain drug that they found. And anyway, uh, you'll have to watch it. Is that, uh, which actress Charlotte is that? Charlotte Johansson. Oh yeah, I'm a big fan of her. I'll definitely watch that. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's it's a hard question. How do you turn off the internet everywhere forever? To the extent that that is possible, Bitcoin would face an existential threat. Um, but I don't know. I have more faith in humanity's resilience um, that as you attack, say you start attacking central internet providers, well, you're creating incentives for people to create things like mesh networks where you can have local internet distribution hubs. Um, you know, the more you censor people on certain platforms, the more you're creating demand for censorship resistant platforms. So it's there's always this cat and mouse game. We, it, it's a, there's a tendency, it's like a low resolution thinking to be like, oh, the internet's on or off. It's like, well, that's not how it actually works. It's <laughs> where there's computers that are connected. And the more you try to disconnect computers, the more people start to scramble and maneuver and reposition themselves to reconnect computers with other technologies. So it seems very unlikely to me that we would get that. Um, now, you, I guess the a counter argument here would be, oh, well, what about a solar flare or some type of global EMP that just permanently wipes out all electronics? I'm like, okay, if you're going to go to this total catastrophic scenario, well, also, everything's fucked in that scenario. Your online banking is fucked. All the internet, all, all your, everything, all your electronics, they're fried. Mm -hmm. So, if you're planning for that, then maybe Bitcoin's not for you. But uh, <laughs> right. you got bigger gets, problems. Yeah, exactly. In that world, guns and food and all these things become money pretty quickly, and we we right. we, we start degenerate over. quickly. And we start over. Yeah, we would start I mean, over. Yeah. I mean, how many times? I mean, this we're in the what sixth extinction? They say. I don't know. Don't know. Haven't been along alive long enough to know which extinction we're in. Yeah, I only remember the last one, but you know, <laughs> that's what they say. And like, I, I mean, it's it's a curious thought, and um, you know, and what causes that too? Yeah. Yeah. Well, all the cosmological disasters, notwithstanding. I think the best thing we can do to save ourselves from our own self-destruction is to fix the money. I uh, thought you were going to say therapy, but the, <laughs> that would also ther help. Therapy, therapy is useful too. Um, <laughs> and this is the a common mantra in Bitcoin circles is fix the money, fix the world. And of course, it's an oversimplification. I don't think fixing money fix out, fixes everything. I really don't. But from an engineering mm. standpoint, I don't think there's a bigger problem we can solve. And that's why... I've tried to commit my life to amplifying this message because it seems like it's pretty obvious, but a lot of people aren't looking at it. Well, fix the money. And earlier we were talking about sort of more of the symbolism or of money and um, and what's that what that's reflecting within the human experience. And so I would say from a more esoteric standpoint, fix the money, fix the fix your fix your greed fix your fix your um uh honesty fix yeah. fix the fix the things that fuck money up yeah and who's gonna do that anymore then if you fix what the negative yeah. of money like why do they say money is the root of all evil well the love of money is the root of all evil is in the bible mm -hmm. and I mean, look, I, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I would say money is an instrument of worldly desire, right? It's it's a technology, it's a tool. If you love worldly things, then you're probably going to be blind to spiritual things, higher principles. So I agree with that. The love of money, uh, it depends how you define love. And, and now in the Bible, Oftentimes when the word love is used, it's talking about agape, which is like the highest form of Christian love, the selfless love you have for your newborn child. Um, there's So three Greek words I know of that are used for love is eros, which is consumptive love, where we get words like erotic, but it can mean like, I love steak. I want to consume the steak, right? Uh, there's philia, which is more like family or friendship love where you want ongoing reciprocal opening, right? I wanted to get to know you more deeply such that you get to know me more deeply, such that I can know you more deeply. 
I don't want to eat my friends, hopefully, right? So it's not eros, it's philia. And then agape is this selfless love where you come home with your newborn child. They're not even, there's not even reciprocity, right? They're just kind of an inert yeah. little lump. Mm-hmm. Yet you love them more than Anything any you've ever love loved. you've ever experienced. So it agape would be inappropriately attached to money in my estimation. So if that was if that was a form of love being used in that passage, which I'm not sure, you'd have to check the Greek translation, I would say that makes sense. That would be the root of all evil. If you had total you know, self-abandoning love or money, well, then you've got some problems. Then you do need some therapy in that case. <laughs> well, it's definitely abandoning morals. I mean, it, I would yeah. think that that's a very common problem with money is it abandons morals, it abandons... Um, but another way to, to say what you were just saying, I think is, again, fix the money, fix the world. You could translate that to fix the incentives, fix the world. And we're back to that idea of our individual characters and our paths of moral development are an emergent property of the incentive structures we inhabit. So if I lived tens of thousands of years ago and I was a hunter and gatherer, it would be very moral for me to be an excellent spear thrower, right? People would appreciate that. I would be celebrated because I could go and I can hunt and I can bring down big animals and I can feed mm-hmm. the tribe. Mm-hmm. That would be like one of the most celebrated skill sets. Mm-hmm. Well, in 2023, I mean, maybe if you're in the Olympics throwing javelin, you could get celebrated for that, but you're not going to be celebrated. I'm not going to make a lot of money off that. <laughs> exactly. So it's there's as the incentives change based on our tech, the technological realities we're inhabiting, so too do our moral appraisals of one another and and uh you know what skills and talents and character traits are prized and rewarded so it's interesting to think about what an honest money world could look like all of a sudden we're violence and these things just they don't pay they're not profitable so they wouldn't be as celebrated i don't, I don't think we would celebrate people statesmen right well like Biden or Putin or any of these other guys, not that we celebrate them that much anymore anyways, but historically we have. And we'd celebrate entrepreneurs more, like the people that actually create useful goods and services for the world. Those would be our elites, right? We would have entrepreneurial elites versus political elites. And that seems like that would be a really good thing for for human humans. Absolutely. I mean, I completely agree with that. I, I wonder what happens to the government without central banking. I mean, just take taxes, for instance. I feel like I've seen things in the past where people look very hard for the actual legal language to support needing to pay taxes. Mm-hmm. And that they, these, these, you know, these IRS agents can't find it. And then they just decide to stop paying taxes because they can't find the actual language, but then the mafia comes after you. Mm. So um, absent a central bank, governments are central governments federal governments are constrained they can't they can't print money to paper over losses so their growth is constrained and now your only forms of revenue for a state with the central bank you have inflation so you can print money to generate revenue if you can't print money so you don't have a central bank the only thing you can do is taxation so you have to go or you could also borrow that's not technically revenue but you could you could finance government initiatives through borrowing, which we've done a lot, right? We used to sell bonds in wartime and all that. But now you go from a situation where with inflation, you just print money and then you blame everyone else for prices going up. You know, it's Putin's fault, it's Beyonce's fault, it's whoever's fault. And people don't understand what's going on. They don't understand they're being robbed by the central bank. When you remove the central bank, the government now has to go to individuals and say, hey, uh, you know, for instance, the Iraq war in the US, we're blowing up people on the other side of the world and uh, your share of that bill is $80,000. You know, please send your check here. And people will be like, what the fuck is this? Like, no, I'm not, I, you know, it's ex- it's explicit taxation versus implicit taxation. Mm-hmm. And the more explicit taxation is, the more resistant people are to it because they can see it. You yep. see the bill and you see what it's funding, right? You see what the government's doing with it and you see how much they're charging you. And so people become much more resistant in that world that constrains government growth. So that's obviously a good thing. I can't see how it continues or it just starts over again. I mean, 
if they don't have money essentially to do anything, what? Yeah, it's, it becomes like a normal business. If your if your P and L, if you're not if your profit and loss statement is not profitable, well, then you start selling off pieces of the business until you become profitable, right? right? You have to shrink until you become profitable. And so all the rampant government overspending we have, again, it's an, an incentive problem. When you can produce money out of thin air, of course you're going to spend it recklessly. Of course. If I had a money printing machine on my table, I would probably spend it recklessly too. Like it doesn't cost me anything to produce the money, yet I can go out into the world and acquire things that cost other people time, effort, energy. Totally. We play That's the it. game fairly, right? Essentially, we do yeah. something, we get money, we... You but trade they, favors to get favors. Exactly. You know, they don't play favors out of thin air. Exactly. It must catch up to them at some point, and it sounds like it has. I hope so. I don't, I mean, when you really look at it, and so I call it the biggest con in human history, it's the biggest pyramid scheme in human history in terms of purchasing power stolen. I have a piece I wrote called Masters and Slaves of Money that actually develops a proxy for the number of human hours stolen through money printing. Um, and I, you know, I've been criticized heavily for saying this, but I don't know what else you call systemized time theft other than slavery, right? It's not whips and chains and pick and cotton kind of slavery, but you're still in hours and working energy and effort from people, oh, yeah. even though it's in this shadowy kind of implicit manner, uh -huh. it's still time theft. You're and then still you just stealing. draft them with the silly TV shows and, reds and circuses. politics and reds and blues. Or, and Or bread and circuses, I think is what they call it in ancient Rome. Like, bread and totally. As long as you give people bread and circuses, they don't care about what's going on. I was just in Rome and went to the Colosseum and it's like, they did. They I can't remember exactly how many hundred days in a row, a thousand. They, they went on and on and had these games every day for so many days. Yeah. And you Get, they get their bread. They have their circus. It distracts from whatever else is going on. Is there a is there a um, a, a governing structure that has been the most successful in history, or are we still learning? Well, you know, conventional wisdom today is that democracy is the greatest governance structure ever created. Um, however. I think it has many problems. There's a great book on this. You could just read the introduction in chapter one to this book and get the gist of it. It's titled Democracy, the God that Failed by Hoppe. H-O-P-P-E is the author's last name. Really good book. Uh, dense and kind of difficult, but he makes a case that monarchy actually has many advantages over democracy. And uh, the monarch, for instance... Typically, it's a hereditary hereditary monarchy, right? So the father, the king, runs mm -hmm. the kingdom, and then he passes it on to his son, who passes it on to the grandson. There's a long-term interest, then, in the integrity of that society, because mm -hmm. I know that my son is going to get it, and his grandson's going to get it. So now, the people that I'm governing, right, the baker and the blacksmith, etc., I'm aligned with them because they're passing their businesses on in a hereditary fashion too. So our son's interests are aligned. Our grandson's interests are aligned. And so you start to think really long term. You don't want to overtax the population because they will revolt and kill you because it's very clear who runs the monarchy. You don't want to go to war too much because you will bankrupt the monarchy and you would that's the end of your business. Your son wouldn't, would not inherit anything. And so there's kind of this system of checks and balances and this long-term orientation. And when you contrast that to democracy, there's a great quote about democracy. It says, every public election is an advanced auction on stolen goods. We vote these people into power for four to eight years. They cut as many deals as they can to get oh as many God. kickbacks and whatever. And then is. they just literally pass off, like filling the whole all of society with hidden risk and problems. And then they just check out of office and pass all that on to the next guy. And so the next guy is doing the same thing. It's just this like, there's an incentive for short-termism and plundering that exists in democracy that does not exist inside of a monarchy. Um, and when you combine that with central banking, right? It's systemic theft through currency debasement. Um, yeah, I think democracy is a terrible idea actually. And what does the future look like on a Bitcoin standard? Maybe something more like digital monarchies where there's just little free private cities that have different um, 
agreements between them, right? Like if you're a, a citizen of one city, maybe you have reciprocity with 50 other cities that you can travel to. Uh, you would pay them some fixed fee, presumably, versus being taxed on your income or capital gains, et cetera. You just pay for, hey, look, it's like a, it's like being a member at a club. I'll just pay you my membership fee once a year, and mm-hmm. you don't need to know how much money I make. You don't need to know what I do. You don't need to know anything about me. You just need to know that we have a contract, and I paid it. And when I'm here, I expect these services, right? I get security, property rights, whatever it may be. Oh, yeah, you, pay, I, you, know, you just pay a fee. Yeah. So you move from a world of taxation to a world of just security fees. Hmm. And um, yeah, but the world would be a lot more prosperous because people would be able to keep the fruits of their labor. And the extent to which people can keep the fruits of their labor is the extent to which they can flourish. Um, and yeah, it would be a world, hopefully, again, with less theft, less violence, and less deception. Well, I was going to ask you about Trump because- you know, with election stuff, and I'm sure you're not going to be divisive about anything, but it would be said that he is more of a businessman and that essentially like the country was financially more successful with him. So should the country not be run like a business then? I mean, again, I'm going to go back to just the failings of democracy there. I don't think there's any human you can put in the the Oval Office that will really improve things. Do you think it really matters, to be honest? No, I don't. We talked about JFK earlier. Like I sort of consider him the last real president we had because he was, what's that saying? That for every thousand striking at the leaves, there's one strike at the root. And he was striking at the root of the problem. He's like, no, oh, the Federal Reserve is a problem. Let's start to take power away from the Federal Reserve. That That is the most important first step to restoring you know, freedom and truth in the world. And mm-hmm. JFK was taking that step and he was assassinated shortly thereafter. So... Mm-hmm. Every president since then, I think, has been just hacking at the leaves at best. Got it. All right. Well, then what do we do? What do we do to, what would be your recommendation for someone like me who has no digital currency? I have no Bitcoin. I have nothing. Everything is in dollars. Like what happens to someone's wealth if it's in dollars at this point in time? I guess, first of all, I'll say is I never want to be prescriptive about what someone should do with their wealth, right? It's each of us has our own unique situation, risk tolerance, blah, 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 blah. Um, I encourage people to study Bitcoin. I did not say buy Bitcoin. I said study Bitcoin and study the nature of money. I think these are very useful intellectual explorations and it, it pulls back a lot of veils that we've We've been conditioned to think of things in a certain way. You know, again, we talked about like the moral excuses for warfare that we hear in school. You know, the Civil War is here to stop slavery. It's like, no, that's not true. It's a story about money and taxation. So you can see through that bullshit just by studying money, the nature of money. Um, so that's like that's my recommendation. Actually, it's not. It's I guess you could say it's financial advice because the studying will change the way you you construct your portfolio it'll change the way you manage your time it'll change the way you invest in yourself but i'm not here to advocate for any particular position including bitcoin i just advocate for bitcoin because of all of the the features that i think it offers humanity right as a civilization and then i guess just to speak to your last question there yeah if you're holding your wealth in dollars you're holding an asset that can be readily counterfeited by a central bank. So you have to question how scarce and valuable those dollars will remain over time versus holding something that cannot be readily counterfeited like physical gold or Bitcoin or even stocks, right? Stocks can't be counterfeited typically as rampantly. Even bonds are more scarce than dollars. That's not to say dollars don't have use, right? I hold dollars too. Um, I typically just use them for working capital for my businesses, and then I keep my long-term savings in harder assets. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, assets are assets are probably a good idea at this point in time, just in transition phase, I suppose. Right? Yeah. Buy yeah. something in dollars now, and essentially, someone could buy it from you in Bitcoin in the future, and essentially, you're sure. kind of laterally moving as opposed to having to start over in some kind of way or sort of not get as much for your money. Yeah, and just also be cognizant of counterparty risk, which is a lot of things we think we own. We really just have a promise to the thing. 
This includes the dollars in your bank. You don't own mm -hmm. the dollars in your bank. You have a creditor debtor relationship with the bank. You have loaned them the dollars. They might pay you the dollars back or they might default. All right. We've seen banks it's go under. Bad, saw a lot go under this year. If you look historically, it's really bad. Like banks go under all the time. So don't get lulled into this false sense of confidence mm. that the numbers on my online banking are my numbers and like they're always going to be there. Good. Uh, stocks as well. Stocks get over issued. Going to buy the boat. I'm going to buy the planes. I'm going to buy more houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even those things, right? Real estate. Like we think I own the house. Well, try not paying your property taxes for a few years and you'll find out who really owns the house. Um, Whatever. You got to consider counterparty risk and everything that you own. And so the only thing that you can own free of a counterparty is what's called a bearer asset, right? The gun that you keep in your house, the physical gold you have in your backyard, the Bitcoin you have in self-custody. These things are bearer assets. There's no counterparty. You hold it and control it and possess it directly. And that's, uh, you know, you need definitely need some direct control over some assets in case things get bad. Because you don't want to be left holding a bunch of promises when people start to break their promises. All right. Well, thank you. That's some good advice. I really basically just get the total understanding that once you understand what's really going on, you will reframe everything and it will lead you in the right direction. Yeah. Bitcoin is a heck of an intellectual rabbit hole and it will change the way you see everything. Well, if it's taken a while for you to figure it out, it's uh, I better get started. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. It was for sure. You're very smart. Thank you.